Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being a dedicated and positively selected group of people that come on a Sunday morning. Uh, I'm very excited to uh, introduce our two speakers today for our panel and discussion on the aggregate effects of a universal basic income program. Our first speaker will be Mikalas Nikiforos. He is a research scholar at the Levy Institute working in the State of the U.S. and World Economies Program. He works on the stock flow consistent macroeconomic model of the Institute for the U.S. Economy. And he contributed to the recent construction of a similar model for Greece. He holds a BA in economics and a master's in economic theory from the Athens University of Economics and Business and an MPhil and PhD in economics from the New School for Social Research. Our second speaker is Kent Smetters, who is the Bettner Chair Professor at Wharton Business School, a faculty research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research and director of the Penn Wharton budget model. Previous policy positions include the Congressional Budget Office, as well as Deputy Assistant Secretary for the United States Treasury. Smetters received his PhD in economics from Harvard, where he wrote his dissertation under Marty Feldstein, who passed away earlier this week. So, I'll first give about 15 minutes to the first speaker and then another 15 minutes. I'll ask a few questions to both speakers to kick off the discussion, and then I'll open up the floor to questions. Yes. And I'll give about a one minute warning. Good morning. Uh, everyone, uh, they told me not to lean on this uh, podium, so I have to <laughs> keep my hands behind my back. Okay, so my name is Michalis Nikiforos. Uh, I I am at the Libya Economics Institute of uh, Bard College, and I will I would like to tell a few things about a report we prepared a couple of years ago um, for the with the Roosevelt Institute uh, on uh, modeling the macroeconomic effects of the universal basic income. Uh, to to prepare this report, so I, uh, we used the the Levy Institute uh, macroeconometric model. So let me say a few things about our model, so uh, that I I think we can understand the you know the results and the difference of our re our results uh, with the results that can be uh, present later if we understand the difference in the in the two models. Uh, so the the Levy model was created in. Um, in the late 90s, uh, it is used to examine the medium-run prospects of the U.S. economy, and uh, we usually, we often produce reports that simulate the effect of different policy options and other scenarios. Uh, it is Keynesian, so this is a distinct, distinctive characteristic of the model compared to more conventional macro, uh, macroeconomic applied macroeconomic models, meaning that um, the performance of the economy is driven by mostly by aggregate demand, although supply factors play a, play a role, but it's mostly aggregate demand that drives uh, the model in the short, but also in the medium and long run. Uh, also, the important characteristic of this model is that uh, it takes, uh, it, it allows for an integrated treatment of the real and the financial sides of the economy. So again, usually, the usual projections that you see around uh, these are supply-side models where money, debt, um, and this kind of stuff, they don't really play any role, at least in the medium run. So there is this uh, neutrality of money or this sort of classical dichotomy, as uh, sometimes uh, people refer to it uh, in these models. And our model, I mean, we, 
we are happy that uh, we were able to successfully predict the crisis of 2001, the crisis of two, uh, 2007 and 2009, and also the slow recovery that, uh, that followed uh, the recent crisis. Uh, so just to give you an idea, the, the, you know, one of the main messages um, and one of the main reasons why we were able to predict the crisis of 2007-2009 and also the slow recovery is because the model allows for an integrated treatment of the real and the financial side of the economy. So, as I said, uh, debt plays an important role in, in our model and the, in the behavior of the system of the model. So, as we see here, we, you know, in the years before the crisis, we had a very sharp increase in, uh, in the debt of the household sector. This increase in the debt of the household sector was basically ignored by most people, but in our model, this is a very central you know, characteristic. And what we argued, uh, I was not there, but what people argued uh, before the crisis was that this sort of increase in the debt-to-income ratio of the household sector is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. And then the situation obviously becomes even worse if you decompose um, uh, the debt-to-income ratio in the debt-to-income ratio of the top 10%. You see that because of the increase in the income share of the top 10%, the debt-to-income ratio of the top 10% income in income distribution remains pretty stable, but there is a spectacular increase in the debt-to-income ratio of the bottom 90%, because you have a stagnation of the income. And related to that, this is just to get an idea of you know, what, we, what we're talking about uh, in, in our reports. A another important factor that led to the crisis and it's uh, a structural problem for the U.S. economy is high income inequality. High in why is this a, a problem? Well, you see here that this is an index of uh, average personal consumption expenditure for all households and this is an index uh, for the bottom 90% average income, uh, normalized in, uh, to 19047. So we see that in the first 30 years or so of the post-war period, the two indices move together. Then the average income of the bottom 90% stagnates. So <clears throat> in order to support this increase in consumption demand, you needed, you know, a necessary requirement was this build-up in debt that I showed in my previous graph. Again, this build-up in debt uh, was um, is obviously unsustainable. You, can ha you cannot have an increase in the debt-to-income ratio of the private sector uh, forever. Um, and again, after the crisis, we, we have repeatedly argued that given the structural characteristics of the U.S. economy, the, 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 the recovery sh will be slow, right? Uh, why is that? Well, because before the crisis, uh, growth was based on the increase in the debt-to-income ratio of the private sector. So we didn't think that it was very likely that households would start uh, accumulating debt in the same way that they did before the crisis. And this, this has been one of the main factors why the economy has stagnated after the crisis. Uh, at the same time, the conventional wisdom was that uh, the Council of Economic Advisors in 1999, a couple of years before the crisis, was projecting that the GDP would grow by 2.5% between the, then and the year 2005. Uh, the CBO at the same time was projecting a rise in the budget surplus through the next 10 years, from 1999 to 2009. In 2004, famously, the governor of the Fed talked about the Great Moderation. In 2006, just a year before the crisis, the CBO was projecting an average growth of 3.4% for the years 2006-2010 and 2.7% for the years 2011-2015. So the, nothing was wrong until the crisis hit. Right? It com completely missed. And after the crisis, this is, this is a graph from the 2016 economic report of the president these are the projections of the IMF for the world real GDP. So what we see here is that the crisis hit, but then 
you know, the conventional projection was that the economy would rebound very quickly and go back and start growing again the same way it was growing before, uh, before the crisis, right? Obviously, reality, the black line here, the actual growth rate uh, <coughs> was consistently, you know, below the forecast. So the forecast was becoming, uh, you know, year after year, the forecast was, uh, was more optimistic than uh, it turned out, than reality turned out to be. And this is, you know, these are the projections of the IMF for the world real GDP, but if you see the CBO projections for the U.S. economy, you get a similar picture. So if you see the, the Troika projections in Greece for the, you know, when the austerity was implemented, you get a similar picture. And the reason for that, the reason because the crisis was completely missed and why uh, there was this, you know, over-optimism in, uh, in the aftermath of the crisis is because these models are supply-side models and they don't allow for any role for the financial side of the economy. So, uh, this is as a sort of introduction about our model and the differences, the difference of our model with uh, other models. Okay, so in 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 this report we we estimate the effect uh, the effect of uh, three UBI proposals. One, um, uh, with the first proposal is the child allowance of two hundred and fifty dollars per month per child under sixteen. The cost of this would be uh, if you calculate the you know the number of people who are entitled to that is around 1.1% of GDP. Then there is a proposal of a basic income of $500 per month for all, all adults. Uh, the cost of that is around 7.6% of GDP. And then a third proposal of a basic income of $1,000 per month for all adults. This, this is a, a huge you know, number, and obviously, especially the third, uh, you know, the results of the third proposal should be taken with <coughs> Uh, a little cautiously, uh, but anyway, the, the idea of the report is to put some uh, numbers of the table and sort of to to frame the debate. Uh, so we have these three proposals, and then there are four variations of these proposals. One variation is a pure deficit spending variation, meaning that government will transfer this amount of money through an increase to the household sector through an increase in. Uh, its deficit. Uh, the second proposal is a fully tax funded proposal, meaning that we will have a progressive increase in the tax rates, which will ex ante ex match the increase in the government transfers to the households. Right? So this is a sort of ex ante balanced budget proposal. Uh, a third variation is a deficit spending that takes into account distribution effects. What does this mean? Our model is an aggregate model, so the household sector is treated as one entity, right? It's, uh, it's uh, one sector. Uh, therefore, in, in the baseline configuration of the model, distributional effects are not taken into account. <coughs> However, in a demand-led model, distribution can have important uh, effects on consumption and therefore demand. Why is that? Well, because poor households, households at the uh, lower end of income distributions, they con their, their propensity to consume is much higher than rich households. Right? So this is a sort of a standard stylized fact of, uh, uh, in economics. Therefore, if you, you know, etc. is paribus, or all other things equal, if you have a redistribution from rich households to poor households, this will increase consumption and therefore will have a positive effect on aggregate demand. Right. Uh, so the third proposal is a deficit spending proposal that takes into account this um, distributional effect. And the fourth proposal is a full, fully tax funded proposal. Again, we have a proposal, an ex ante balanced budget proposal that though takes into account this distribution effect. So essentially the fourth variation is a purely distributional variation, meaning what, what is the effect of this redistribution of income on uh, the macroeconomic performance of, uh, of the economy. Uh, so this is a summary of the scenario. So in total we have three proposals, four variations, so in total we have 
uh, we have 12 scenarios. So the, this is the summary of the result. Um, in, so scenarios 1, 2, and 3 uh, are the pure deficit uh, spending uh, proposal. What we see here is that we have a significant increase in real GDP. Obviously, scenario 3 is mar much larger and therefore we get a, a much uh, a larger effect. But also in scenario 2, we see that over the course of 8 years, this, this is the difference of this variable compared to to the baseline uh, to the uh, to a baseline scenario that no of these uh, proposals is uh, is implemented uh, over the course of uh, eight years. So we see that there is a significant positive effect of GDP. There is also a mild um, increase in the price level and the nominal wages. The increase in the nominal wages in, is larger and therefore the real wage is also increasing, which is also, I think, a desirable uh, thing in, uh, in the US uh, right now. Government deficit obviously is increasing here because it's a pure deficit in spending scenario. The employment rate is increasing too. And also importantly, the labor force, force participation is increasing. Right? Why is that? Well. We think that one of the main reasons why uh, employment has dropped in the U.S. is because there is not enough aggregate demand, and therefore many people have dropped out of the labor force. Right? This the, this boost in uh, macroeconomic activity uh, allows for an increase in the labor force, so more people get into the labor force. In scenarios four, five, and six, remember these are the um, fully tax-funded scenarios. In uh, w where we don't take into effect, uh, take into account distributional effects. So essentially, there is no effect. Why is that? Well, because you have an aggregate uh, household sector, you transfer some funds from the one side, and then you just tax the same funds from the other side. So in, in scenarios four, five, and six, as one would expect, there is no uh, no change. Uh, so these are the in scenarios. Seven, eight, nine are the scenarios which are uh, deficit spending um, with distributional effects taken into account. Again, we see that relative to the first scenarios, there is, a, you know, growth rate becomes even uh, even higher. And then scenarios 10, 11, and 12. Uh, these are the exempt balanced budget. Uh, scenarios where distributional effects are taken into account. What we see here is that even in these balanced budget scenarios, we have a significant positive effect of uh, of this proposal uh, on economic activity, the price level, uh, the, the real wage. Government deficit decreases. Why is that? Because we the the increase in the tax rate is an ex ante. But, uh, uh, balances the budget ex ante, but because of the increase in real GDP exposed, government deficit uh, falls. Uh, and also we have uh, an increase in the employment rate uh, and the labor force uh, participation. Uh, conclusions, I have zero seconds. So uh, the main conclusion is that, you know, the UBI program would have a positive macroeconomic impact on the U.S. economy. I didn't have time, and hopefully we will have time to talk about it afterwards. The results that we get depend on the modeling assumptions that we have made. Right? I believe that they are reasonable. Uh, a general comment, uh, I don't have time to go into this into detail, but the US economy has many serious structural problems. I don't think that there is a silver bullet for all of them. It's not the UBI or employment. We have to think, adopt, and experiment with various policies and try to, you know, deal with these structural problems at once. So, thank you very much. Thank you.
Smithers. I'm the director of the Penn Wharton Budge. I'm all a professor at the Wharton School. Um, so we also looked at a Roosevelt study, which the Levy Institute did the, the work for. And um, it, I'll focus on one of the scenarios in particular, um, their proposal that, it's, that they would pay about $6,000 a year. This is a $500 a month. Uh, benefit and they predicted again the increase in GDP about 6.8 percent within eight years uh, if the policy was deficit finance. And again, the biggest bang for the buck that they had in their model was from the deficit finance uh, one. It's about 1.5 trillion dollars um, over time, and um, and it, it would uh, borrowing new uh, resources to the increased deficits by about 300 percent. And um, in our dynamic model that would even be uh, a little bit higher. Um, and so we actually find just the opposite, a uh, dramatic fall in GDP um, from this, and which we'll explain uh, in a second. So really quick on the Penn Wharton budget model, um, we start with a very rich household level uh, uh, model. There is, we start with a micro simulation model. There's synthetically hundreds of thousands of households, including lots of households who are borrowing constrained, have a high marginal propensity to consume. It goes into a, a tax calculation, very rich uh, uh, firm levels uh, uh, as well. Firms have debt equity financing, there's different types of firm structures, C-corps, pass-throughs, so forth. And then this goes and feeds into our dynamic overlapping generations uh, model. Uh, and so we spend a tremendous amount of time on validation of the model. We always validate before we do stuff. So for example, we actually go back in time and we say, okay, what would the census data have uh, actually shown us about educational attainment um, over time? And then we uh, go back in time and said, how would the buyer model produce on a sample basis those, um, that prediction? So we do that for education, disability, how would the buyer model produce in the, in the past, uh, family composition that's changing, so we're still seeing income inequality and other uh, things changing in the future. Uh, it, it, you can see this with wage deciles. In particular, the slowdown in growth is an actual outcome of our model. It's because a lot of demographic and other things that have been changing over time, it's not exogenously uh, imposed in the marriage uh, as well, that actually has a big impact on productivity over time and so forth. So we used this model uh, uh, two years ago to look at, for example, the tax reform. Uh, we were the first to say, uh, uh, to come up with a prediction that basically said the tax reform would cost about two trillion dollars over ten years. Um, the Joint Committee on Taxation, CBL, said it was going to be around 1.5 trillion dollars on a dynamic basis and, um, and then Four months after the, 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 the tax reform was set into law, they did a technical revision and came up um, by $430 billion. And so nowadays, $2 trillion is the accepted figure. Um, when I gave a talk earlier in Washington uh, th this week, Nancy Pelosi's talk after me referred to the $2 trillion number. That number comes from our, from our, our framework. We're just now a general agreement uh, on that. So what we did in the case of UBI, is that we, in fact, uh, said, okay, how would have our model predicted and relative to the one UBI experiment that we actually see in the United States, and that's what we have in Alaska with the fund, um, the oil revenues in Alaska. And there's been a fair amount of work on that particular fund. That's the case of external finance. And we looked at some other UBI programs throughout the world, but Alaska is the one we spent more time on because there's more empirical results on. And basically, um, uh, our model predicts very similar to what the best evidence is on, on the Alaska fund. There is some variation in the, in the studies, um, but in terms of labor supply, we're able to uh, replicate that as well. Um, and so, uh, and there's again some additional studies a, a, as well. And our, our model comes very close to that. And really importantly, without add factors, without any type of kind of adjustments to force it. This is not a calibration exercise. This is actually what comes out of, of, the, of the framework without any sort of add factors or anything like that. So let's talk about the deficit of finance case. Because um, that's the one that there's probably the biggest wedge uh, in differences. Again, about $6,000 per year, $1.5 trillion uh, annually. Uh, so we're talking about over $10 trillion over a 10-year uh, uh, budget. 
And what we show is that over time, uh, we can both do short run, medium run, long run. And in the short run, we do have this marginal propensity to, cons to consume. I, I would disagree that monetary policy plays a big role in the short run, even here, just because that what really matters is the fact that you have heterogeneity amongst households in terms of marginal propensity to consume, not so much the role of monetary policy here. Um, when we adjust for monetary policy to try different rules that the Fed could follow, it really does not have that uh, much of an impact. What really matters is the differences in heterogeneity across households um, <coughs> uh, for, for the short run. And the deficit finance case, um, we actually find just the opposite. We actually find a substantial decrease in GDP. And you can kind of get a hint of that right here through the capital services. In particular, higher debt leads to less capital in the economy. And that's the point that probably requires the most conversation here. And that is, in the Keynesian type framework, debt is basically free. It's free money. And so in, in our framework, you have to pay for it eventually. And so you could spread it out over time. And in particular, we actually have very favorable conditions. You can go to our Penn Warren Budget Model website. Our, our article this week is, uh, I had a discussion in Washington with Olivia Blanchard, a well-known economist who is on basically the point uh, president of the AEA Association. And he uh, made a lot of news saying, you know, the cost of debt is much lower than it was in the past, and government borrowing rate much lower, and so forth. We agree on a per dollar basis. That's, that's the way we've been calibrating our model for the last several years, that the, the cost per dollar of debt is much lower than it was in, in, in the past. The point, though, is that we just have a lot more debt than we ever had in the past. So the per dollar cost has definitely gone down. And so there's supposed to be a lot of fireworks in Washington over this whole panel and so forth. It turned out it was pretty much just a, a love fest, because we basically agree. He agreed there's too much debt. I agree that, you know, that the debt cost per dollar has gone down. That's already in our, in, in our framework. The point is, is though, we, we both agree you have to account for the cost of debt. And that's what's fundamentally driving the big differences, is that in particular, when the government, and this is the key insight, when the government floats an additional dollar of debt, it's competing for household savings in the United States and international capital flows. And so, in other words, that's not coming for free. It's competing for that money in capital markets. And so money that households and international capital flows would have otherwise gone into productive capital, some of that money is now going in to uh, finance debt. What is debt? Debt is simply an allowance of society to consume more today without paying for it. That's what federal debt is. So something has to give there. There's not a free lunch there. And so in, in particular, that if that dollar is now going to for consumption today, from a society's perspective, government is allowing us to, you know, whether it's a tax cut, whether it's a spending increase, allowing us to do something today that's not, uh, that's not finance. Consumption is higher uh, uh, today than otherwise would be, and that it has to be paid for at some point. And, um, and that's what a closed model allows us to do. It eventually says we have to pay for it. Because again, important point, if, it, if you have a, 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 a given amount of household saving international capital flows, and it's actually not fixed in our model, it will respond to interest rates, things like that. But money that, although if there's no government debt, that money would have gone on productive capital. And that, therefore, would increase GDP. Some of that money gets diverted to allow society to consume more today without having to finance it. Therefore, um, some less of that money goes into productive capital. Um, less of that money gets, uh, therefore, GDP will take a hit. GDP is just a function of capital, labor, and your technology. And so, as a result of that, that's the, the classic what we call the crowd out effect. And there's been study after study after study has shown the crowd out effect. The CBO uses a rule that basically says for every one dollar of debt. A capital stock goes down about 33 cents. They have an empirical rule that they follow. Our, our number is fairly similar. One difference is that there's a reduced form rule. Ours is a structural estimated rule um, coming from a, 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 a derived model. So we have some non-winner effects. So our total debt is a little bit higher in the, by 2050 what the CBO is projecting because of the, the non-winner effects. But nonetheless, we're both on the same table. We're, in, in particular, um, debt has increased dramatically. So it, you can also look at payroll tax finance. 
um, or look at uh, what's called external finance. This is kind of manna from heaven, but payroll tax finance, uh, this is the idea of let's try to finance this using, uh, not deficit, using you know, actual tax revenue. But again, there's nothing for free there. You have to, in fact, allow for the fact that payroll taxes, if people get taxed, they typically like to avoid those taxes. And one way they avoid those taxes, they reduce their labor supply. And, um, and they do other, uh, engage in other activities as well, including income reclassification, what economists refer to as a labor supply elasticity. So the bottom line is really um, uh, it, it, this, this role of debt, the fact that in our model, you have to eventually pay for the debt. And you can, you can bring it along over time and build up interest uh, on it, and therefore, uh, 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 you, the longer you stretch it out, of course, the more you're going to have to pay with interest later on. That cost of stretching it out has gone down over time. There's no question about that. The cost per dollar of debt has gone down because of lower borrowing rates. But the point is, you have eventually have to pay it. It's not a free lunch. And so even on the very debt-friendly assumptions, which is what the, we ran the UBI experiment under, that's a dramatic difference in uh, GDP. So it's a very sharp decrease uh, in, in, in GDP um, uh, for the deficit finance, uh, uh, almost 10% by 2032. Um, and so there's very few policies that have created such a, um, and a, a negative effect through the debt uh, uh, channel. Um, other assumptions that we're making is there, there's some evidence that UBI is potentially improves health of kids and education outcomes. That is actually very controversial amongst in the, in the economic literature. Even if we include that by 2032, it doesn't actually show up in the first decimal place. Even if we include the central estimate, the central estimate is not statistically significant, but if we, we did, it doesn't uh, incorporate, doesn't have um, uh, that much of an impact. But you know, I believe there's possibly a channel there. It's just that it kicks in over kind of a long period of time and doesn't seem to uh, have uh, that big of an impact. So that's really the, uh, the bottom line. We completely agree of having more structure, more detailed model, uh, really trying to make sure you get the household sector right. Um, and in our, in our, in our, we have household debt. That's a really important thing. It's not just, that they, by the way, explicit debt that you see in accounting statements. There's a lot of pay-as-you-go debt um, as well that doesn't show up officially. So anything that's pay-as-you-go finance that's transferred from young to older generations, that is, can be relabeled as debt. It's mathematically equivalent to debt. And we, we capture all that uh, richness as well. It's a neutrality theorem that's well known in, in economics. Um, on the business side, I, again, we have a pretty uh, rich debt equity structure, um, uh, decisions that are made by firms, and uh, again, different uh, firm uh, types as well. And, uh, and again, uh, I, I think you know, the, the two parts of, I think, the biggest difference in the modeling is the assumption of the role of money supply. Um, again, it does, I don't think that plays a material role in this experiment. I think what matters much more is the marginal propensity to consume differences between the households. But the big one is, of course, we, in our framework, you actually have to pay for the debt at some point. And that's where the crowding out of, of capital happens, where the government's competing in the capital markets and therefore more debt basically means less productive capital. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I actually have a few questions to uh, kick off the discussion between our two speakers. Uh, my first question is, is for Kent. Uh, so I just want to reiterate that part of his estimates come from the assumption that there is an economy-wide production function where capital and labor uh, go, are inputs into output. Uh, my, well, one question I have is, can you talk a little bit about your assumptions on the elasticity between elasticity of substitution between capital and labor, um, because this would affect uh, the the output effects if 
all of a sudden capital becomes more expensive and there's a decline in capital investment. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, in this analysis, we take a very standard approach to or your details of what's known as Cobb Douglas production, and the idea is that capital and labor are generally uh, complements, they work together. So, what happens is that when you have less capital, the, um, the return to capital actually goes up because capital has become more scarce because more of that savings now goes for immediate consumption through government deficits. Um, as a result, what you have is wages will also go down because labor has now become relatively more available relative to the capital um, in, in that type of world. And so that's where you get this negative wage effect when you have less capital. Um, people are now talking about you know, a newer production functions where capital and labor aren't always um, uh, complements. So this is a so the, the traditional example is you know the, the farmer and the tractor. You know the labor is working together with capital, um, but there's plenty of examples uh, where you know that that tractor also dis displaces some labor, the farm hands and so forth. Um, nonetheless, uh, what's been uh, the, the by far the most empirically validated approach is still Cobb Douglas. Is still what is the conventional. Uh, uh, use um, of where those complements, but you could actually modify this and say, suppose that some capital can actually produce output without labor, and that is, it's, a, it's now substitutable. So Darren, Darren S. McGlue at uh, MIT is doing some um, uh, production functions uh, uh, with that. There's no accepted canonical model right now. It's still very much a work in progress, but in that case, you can actually have bigger effects because on GDP. Um, wages will potentially respond differently, but GDP effects could actually be bigger. Because what happens now is that some of that capital, which could produce output on its own, that crowd out effect, it, the, the crowd out effect's still there. It's just that it doesn't even need labor anymore because it can, the robots can produce on their own. And so the GDP effects can actually, the negative GDP effects can actually be bigger. They could also be smaller too. It just it really depends on how you calibrate the assumptions that you're using. The real world, is that for the most part, capital and labor are best viewed as complements, but there are clear cases where there are substitutes. And uh, I think that what we reported um, when we did the UBI you know, a year and a half, two years ago, was that this is probably the best you know, central you know, estimate. But you could, you could do some play around that estimate uh, with, the, with, uh, uh, with the production function. Okay, we'll make this a bit more interactive. Uh, I wanted to allow some of the audience to ask the questions in response. Right, so you, you pick, and we, we give them a microphone. Okay, this gentleman. I can try without the mic, it's fine. Oh, thank you. Well, you need it. Oh, sure, I appreciate it. Um, I guess I'm trying to get my head around the tremendous amount of more micro, less computer-driven uh, evidence. So we just heard yesterday from a number of social scientific experiments where people who are homeless are simply given money and now they're not hitting the hospital as much, they're not calling the police as much, yeah. kids back in school. In other words, every time, right? The, yeah. it's, and I, I don't want to be anecdotally driven, I, I, I believe sure. in data, yeah, sure. but it just keeps working. Also, um, there are just huge sections of the United States. I was a community organizer. I don't see capital going there. Mm -hmm. If I have a million dollars and I'm going to make more money, I'm not going to where Massachusetts, the town next to me, it is under the average income of the United States. I'm going to go back to Northampton, yeah. where some of y'all have been. You didn't go to where when you visited Western Massachusetts, right? Your parents would be worried if you bought a house there, right? It's a nice place, really, but it has no money, right? And I, was, I just don't see anything else that a policy panel of advisors would do that would deliver anything to this town y'all have never heard of, right? Um, so I'm trying to get my head around the macro point there, weak markets that are invisible, but also this immense amount of micro data. Yeah. Uh, who, is that directed toward me or to? Um, I feel like I can explain using your model, right? Uh -huh. I guess I'm a Keynesian. Uh -huh. So, uh, yeah. 
I think it's directed toward you. Yeah, okay, sure. So it, there's no question that um, there are some studies that have shown some effects on things like hospital usage um, uh, and other effects at the, at the household level. Keep in mind, the, the, there's a distinction between a welfare program that is really focused on the poor and trying to deliver outcomes versus UBI, which is extremely broad-based. And in particular, even a lot of liberal economists like Greenstein at you know, Center of Budget Priorities is, you know, Laura Tyson, uh, you know, Bill Clinton's uh, former CAA chairperson, they all don't like UBI because it's not focused that way. In particular, it has this big spend um, that's given a, a lot of money to people who aren't in that situation. That's where the big debt effects are really coming from, is that it's not very focused. So that regardless of where that, let's, two, two things. One is that we, we did do some runs where we said, let's incorporate some of the benefits of UBI on the labor supply, labor effectiveness, things like that. Um, redu reduction hospitalization, things like that. Those are really small effects still relative to the entire cost of the program that's given out money to everybody. And so that's, that's the big difference. That debt, regardless of what you do, so that's part A, you get some labor productivity effects. But keep in mind, and this is gonna, when you're talking about increasing the productivity of someone who has pretty low productivity to begin with, you know, a couple percent, the aggregate effects is gonna be still pretty small relative to the capital side when you actually say, okay, we're giving out this big broad benefit for a large base, it's not very focused, as a result, we have to finance that debt. And that's the big difference between the two models. In the Keynesian framework, that money is for free. It, there, you don't have to finance that debt. In our framework, you do. And so that's where the crowding out comes from. I want to also, I want to also introduce uh, another sort of subtopic for discussion between the two panelists, and then I'll turn over the um, questions to the audience. Uh, I'm a labor economist. I'm particularly interested in employment and wages. And I'd like to ask each of you to talk about uh, what your model says about the labor share income, uh, which is a function of both wages and employment. So my question to uh, Michaelis is, it seems from the model that the labor share of income, uh, the labor share value added is increasing because employment and wages are increasing. Um, so explain a little bit more about why wages are increasing and employment is increasing. And, um, and then same question for Kent. Right. Um, okay, so the, lab the labor share in our simulation is increasing because the labor share is essentially real wage times employment over out, right? So in our model, we have a significant increase in the real wage. As, as you saw, there is an, a larger increase in nominal wage than uh, prices. Okay. Um, and there is also a very large increase in employment. So despite the, the increase in, uh, in GDP, you have an increase in the labor share. I think this is one of the most you know, desirable results. I mean, besides the, macro, the positive macroeconomic effects, we need to think about ways to change distribution of income in the United States. There, there is uh, too much uh, you know, uh, inequality right now. So I think this is, uh, this is a desirable effect. Uh, can, can, I, can I make a comment on, uh, related to, to the previous question? Um, so I th the assumption of a supply side model is that output is a function of productivity, the capital stock, and, and labor. And labor supply, not labor demand. So, and how is labor supply determined? Well, everybody has a, an optimization problem. This is how we do things in economics. And everybody gets utility from consumption and leisure. But to get consumption, you have to work. So you have this trade off between working to get income and consume or leisure. Now, the important thing about this, this model, 
is that whatever unemployment we see, or whatever employment, it means that this is a voluntary decision of the individual. So people who are not working right now, besides some frictional unemployment, the, the underlying idea there is that they choose not to work. It's not that they're not, there is not enough demand for them to work. It's, it's because that um, you know, they choose, they, they optimize their behavior and they, they choose not to work. This is, this is something that, you know, in my opinion, given you know, the large pockets of unemployment that we see in the U.S., the large drop in the employment population ratio, and so on and so forth, is not very, uh, very convincing. Yeah, that's one version of the model. Uh, in fact, you can e easily have a, what's called a search model of labor supply, where the labor, the labor matching. We just turned it off in in this in these results because it wasn't that important. In particular, uh, you can actually explicitly model that. It's just that it's not a reduced form assumption, and that is you have labor supply, you have labor demand, and they they face a search function, a diamond type uh, model. And that is, we, we desire to explicitly model those things instead of having add factors to try to, to, to force it. It just wasn't that important in, in this framework. Keep in mind that you can actually have just the opposite effect. What we saw in Alaska, for example, we actually saw a reduction in labor supply with UBI because of the income effect. And so it, it's, it's not, the, necessarily true, uh, that whereas the EITC can encourage labor, the UBI can actually go in this, the opposite direction and actually reduce labor. The EITC actually has a substitution effect that basically says you're going to get the money if you, if you supply labor. The UBI says you're going to get the money even if you don't supply the labor. So typically the UBI actually works in the opposite direction of encouraging labor supply. Um, that's what we've seen, in, oh, by the way, empirically, that's also what, what we see in, in our framework. And again, having the search model turned on uh, where you do get endogenously unemployment just doesn't have an effect in, the, in this framework. But the, the real driver is paying for debt. Do you want to say anything about the labor share of income? Oh yeah, so in our model, the labor share of income over time has definitely decreased. The capital share has gone up. There's really two reasons for that. One is uh, purely reporting, and that is taxes drive a lot of what is reported as labor income versus capital income. So think about carried interest for hedge fund managers. That's the most obvious one. Most, I believe some of that is capital income because the way you know, general partners are required by limited partners to have some skin in the game. But a lot of that is just labor income that gets reclassified for tax reasons as capital income. Think about S-corps. S-corps, uh, they're small, but they're huge in aggregate. There's a lot of incentive to, re to reclassify your labor income as capital income. That's actually changed or, since 1986. So a lot of that is just reporting. On the other hand, even on top of reporting, um, you have real effects in the economy. So we, we have the labor supply, um, the labor share has gone down in our, in our framework, and that was actually endogenously produced as a result of demographics in our framework. Because a lot of interesting demographics that are happening is baby boomers are highly productive or going into retirement, re being replaced with less productive younger people um, who eventually become more productive. Um, uh, but we actually are predicting in our framework that the capital share will continue to increase a little bit, inequality will continue to increase a little bit as well. Uh, okay, and I just also want to point out that um, what these models may or may not be incorporating is that female labor supply is very elastic to many factors. I don't believe it's in this Keynesian model, but I believe it's... It is, yeah. That's the biggest, the biggest source of elasticity are secondary earners, um, and it is, uh, and then some other, other margins as well, but that's, that, that's the biggest source, yeah. Okay, uh, I'd like to open it up to more questions from the audience. Second person in the, in the yellow. Thank you. Slightly different type of question. Um, 
And I just want to say that as a mother of a, a, an economist in training, I say this with full love in my heart. Uh, Evelyn, Evelyn Forge, who's an economist, health-based care economist out of uh, the University of Winnipeg in Canada, who's very much involved in basic income, she sent my economist and budding training son an article uh, say that referred to the discrepancy between male and female economists, the numbers of them, and it pointed to the fact that one of the reasons is some of the top ten economists journal, economics journals are very much focused on modeling, on the, on the financial um, data-driven modeling, whereas female economists are generally more driven by value-based. What type of life do we want, quality of life, examples like that. I don't want to make this a gender question, but the question is this. So in schools, and I, the fact is this massive diversity in the audience, uh, in the panel, in, in, in perspectives, so a question from, to all of you, but focused on the representative from Wharton School. How much discussion in the economics department in Wharton takes into consideration the different, these different types of perspectives? The algorithmic modeling that is required versus the value-based questions of what type of a life do we want to create? So how much is that taken into consideration and should there be more of it? Um, yeah. I, I, uh, colleagues with one of those female economists who's in the top ten of female economists by reference by citations and I think she would push back on your characterization that they are uh, she's not about the modeling and, and about the empirical um, at, at data as well but it ultimately comes back these value judgments come back to what we call the social welfare function which is just you know Yes, I th economists love being mathematical and explicit in our assumptions. That's what it really comes down to. It's about being extremely explicit. And so when you say, okay, what is the values that we're trying to go for, either it's a society or what people themselves value, um, the, when it comes to what people themselves value, that's empirically testable. We can go out and try to figure out what do people value when they make tra trade-offs. What does society value? We could try to estimate that, but that's a lot more normative and subjective. And so that comes down to when uh, we say what is the most optimal policy, we do mathematically model what is that value system, and it's called a social welfare function. That's where some debate comes in. So Rawls, you know, Rawlsian really placed a lot more weight on the marginal utility that is the, the benefit to lower income people. A utilitarian says, you know, I weight everybody equally, but what I'm going to do is recognize that once you have more money, you know, the marginal utility, the marginal benefit to you, the marginal happiness is, go, is still positive, but it's going down. And so therefore, a rich person values an extra dollar, but not as much as a poor person. So that will automatically take into account um, that uh, the fact that, you know, therefore we want to do some redistribution subject to the distortions in the economy. So the idea is that in a utilitarian framework, you still want to do a lot of redistribution, but you have to, at the same time, if you're reducing the size of the pie too much, you only want to go so far. So you don't want perfect equality. And then you have the Chicago guys. Chicago guys. Uh, and they completely reject this idea of what's called transferable utility that you should, you should be even thinking about, you know, trying to think about comparing people's, you know, how much they value a dollar across people. Um, and so they would, they're basically more, you know, traditionally more libertarian, Nozick and so forth. And so those debates go on. But for us, you know, we model stuff even on the, the, the standard, you know, the utilitarian approach and you know, when necessary. And that's the approach when people like Emmanuel Sayas and others talk about high marginal tax rates being efficient. That's the, exactly the social welfare function that he's using as well. I also just want to say that GDP is very different from household welfare, yeah. and that also um, there's a lot of implicit discussion about increasing labor supply that's not necessarily maximizing individual or household welfare because of uncompensated care for children and elderly. Another question? This gentleman in the blue. Uh, thanks, Kent, for the courage to come give us the bad news. And uh, so we heard your a request and a question. The request is, um, we heard your general critique of the other model. Did we hear McAllister's general critique of the Wharton model? And the, uh, the question is, um, in 20, 
18, the governor of the Bank of Canada said that uh, the Canada Child Benefit, which is basically a national scale basic income where over a million families are getting an average of $700 a month, we've had none of the problems people associate with the basic income. The governor of the Bank of Canada said that that program is responsible for half a percent GDP growth in 2018. Who knows how much it's been now over three years. Could you guys put those comments in perspective based on your models? It is responsible for half percent GDP growth? In the year of 2017. Or positive half percent? Positive, okay. positive. Well, okay, so in, I mean, from my perspective, this can be due to two factors. One is a demand factor, because it allows, from a macroeconomic point of view, it allows people to have an income, consume, increase their demand, and therefore uh, have a positive effect on, uh, on output. Uh, and also there, there are significant productivity effects. These productivity effects are not taken into account in our simulations, either, uh, in Ken simulations. But also productivity effects can be can be important. I, I think there are these two two channels that can have a positive effect. Yeah, I mean, in our framework, you you said this is tied to having a child. Keep it, keep in mind that the United States has a large child tax credit as well, and in some cases that's even refundable. That, and so as a result, you do have large transfers in the United States based on having a, a child that's often redistributing money uh, toward households that have high margins of propensity to consume. So in the short run, you could actually get the stimulus, the, the consumption, and so forth. I'm always suspicious when the government reports the numbers. Um, I, I would like to know what the academic study really <laughs> shows. Um, governments, you know, often are somewhat biased <laughs> in that. Um, yeah, but still, but you know, I, 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 like to, I would like to see more academic studies on that, but it would work in our model if you are redistributing money toward, based on kids, that would typically reward high margins of propensity to consume households in the short run. Uh, do you want to respond? Yeah, just one, one uh, I just remember this. So we also need to keep in mind that GDP is not always the you know the best indicator of welfare, yeah. right? I mean, um, there is a citation of this uh, in in Kent's report of this paper by the Spande 2016, who finds that removing child removal children with disabilities from the supplemental security income program leads to parents earning more income. Okay, meaning that you know. Obviously, if I had a, a kid with disability and I didn't have any support, I would try to work, you know, a second job and a third job and a fourth job, whatever, to, especially in the U.S., to make uh, ends meet. But this does not mean that if there is a support for this kid and I reduce my labor supply, this this is a bad thing from you know a social welfare point of view. Yeah, no question. So, GDP is not a metric of welfare. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. And I think we have to make this our last question. Okay. Sorry, this probably isn't going to be a question, but <coughs> but I just I I want to continue on Floyd's point. This benefit that goes to families with children has been in place long term for 25 years now. I mean, there was there have been revisions along the line, but we've got like a whole generations history of this. The amount now is equivalent to that model that, that you're looking at that's about $500 a month. So if you've got a family of four, like two adults and two kids, this would be exactly the same as, as what that is proposing. And so we've been running this for a long time. This last bit of news about GDP increase is actually just the tip of the iceberg that adds on to all of the other evidence we have of positive health, education, reduction of less desirable behaviors, and all of those things. So it all really does seem to be working together and has huge political support. Yeah, I can't talk about the political support, but again, in the United States, we actually do have a program like this, and it actually got bigger with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. It's called, again, we have a child tax credit, so refundable tax credit. It, it's not as explicit as a dollar check in the mail. It shows up on, on your tax form. Um, and so the real issue here 
is how are they financing it? If they're actually paying for this program, and it's not just pure debt finance, then there is a chance that it could have you know, a positive impact through uh, uh, shifting the consumption toward higher margins of propensity to consume. It could also, um, uh, but what we we're, we were talking about is mainly this U, uh, a new UBI benefit that is adding debt on top of an existing debt path. And that's, that's the big difference, is that we actually have to pay for that debt in our framework. Even at this really favorable borrowing rate, we make other assumptions that are, if anything, that are very debt friendly. Um, and that's where the negative uh, effects are, are coming from. So I do put, you know, and I'll say this again, you know, I, I, we know from the, the previous literature, I'm I looking at different UBI, whether it's Alaska, whether it's um, other, uh, other uh, programs, there's a lot of, you know, let's say heterogeneous, you know, heterogeneity in estimates of the effectiveness and so forth. Um, I'm not ever going to rely on one single study to try to form an, an opinion, especially a study whether it's either by the central bank or by the government. I, I want to see um, something that has a little bit, uh, that is gonna, that's a little bit broader than that. But even if we took it at face value, um, it really comes down to, in fact, the fact that it's been around for 20 years tells me that they probably are trying to figure out a way to, to finance that, that program. And that, that makes it different than something that's purely debt finance. I'm sorry, we have to wrap up now, but I encourage you to approach the speakers with further questions. Thank you.